Hello, everybody, and welcome to Alpine Learning Group's Innovations in Autism series. We're glad that you're here today. This webinar, Peekaboo ICU, Enhancing Social Communication in Infants and Toddlers, is the last webinar in the series presented over the last few weeks. At the close of this presentation, we'll share a QR code to additional information about the other presentations in this series and where to find the recordings. I'm Dr. Bridget Taylor, the co-founder and CEO of Alpine Learning Group. For over 30 years, I've had the pleasure of working alongside a group of innovative and compassionate leaders in the field of autism. I'm happy we're able to share their expertise with you during this free webinar series. Just a few housekeeping issues. This present presentation is being recorded and will be made available on our website in the coming days. We will also send an email to everybody who's registered so that you can have access to the recording. If you have questions, please use the Q&A in the chat area. Feel free to type questions that come up throughout the presentation, and we'll have a few minutes at the end to answer any questions that you have today. And now I'm very excited to introduce to you Dr. James, Jamie DeQuinzio, who will share information on enhancing social communication in infants and toddlers. Thank you for being here. Dr. DeQuinzio? Thank you, Bridget. Um, thank you everyone for coming and welcome. I wanted to start with today's agenda and who this talk is for. Um, this talk is for parents of young children who might already have a diagnosis, who might be in the evaluation process, or for parents who are concerned about their child's development for any reason and perhaps have not started the evaluation process yet. <clears throat> Today I will begin by reviewing what it means for a child to be at risk for a developmental delay or autism and tools for early screening of your child's development. The bulk of our time together today will focus on parent-led interventions. These are activities that you can do at home, uh, incorporate into your daily routines to promote social and communication skills. These activities are part of Alpine Learning Group's infant and toddler curriculum and parent training program. I will then share some resources for parents and we will have some time for questions at the end. So let's begin. What does it mean to be at risk? A child is considered to be at risk if they are showing the following. Any concerning behaviors or delays, if they have a sibling with autism or some other developmental disability, if there's a familial history of autism or another developmental disability, if they had a premature birth or low birth weight, if there was a difficult pregnancy or delivery, if there is some medical condition that could influence development, if there was a lack of good developmental stimulation early on, or if the child's history early on was unknown. And the final uh, influence for uh, being at risk is exposure to toxins. Before I proceed, I wanna also let everyone know that I have some videos included in the following segments. And I just wanna make a quick statement on those videos. Um, these were recorded uh, following consent by the legal guardians of the children shown in the videos. Um, and it, the consent was provided solely for the use within this webinar. So I will just ask that you please don't use any personal devices to record or take pictures of the children shown in, these, uh, in the webinar. Thank you. So what if you're not sure if your child is showing delays? The CDC does have a, a milestone tracker that is a downloadable app you can track and follow your child's development uh, in the first five years. What's also nice here is that it gives suggestions for activities to do with your child and ways to interact with your child to help promote development. You can scan the QR code that I he have here on the left and you can get to the CDC's developmental milestones. You may have heard that these milestones were recently updated in 2022, this year. So on the right, there is a QR code where you can scan and you can read an article that describes what those updates are. I won't be discussing the milestones today in any detail. It's beyond the scope of this presentation. We do have another presentation from last year uh, from our 
our free parent lecture series last April that is still up on our website. If you're interested in uh, viewing a webinar on the milestones, uh, you can find it there. Hmm. Another great resource for tracking your child's development is called uh, the Baby Navigator. Um, and there's a section called 16 by 16. So it's 16 skills by 16 months of age that you should be looking for that are directly related to autism. Um, after you register, you can do a social and communication screening with your baby. So the QR code that I presented here, I will take you right to that. And here's the actual list of the 16 signs of autism by 16 months that's included in that navigator. So when you scan that QR code, you will see something like this. Okay. And one final resource for parents uh, who would like to track their baby's development. There is, um, if you're concerned specifically at, about autism, there is a screening called the MCHAT, the Modified Checklist for Autism in Toddlers. It's something quick you can do right online. Again, I have provided the QR code. The outcome includes a risk level for autism, and it lets you know whether you should pursue an evaluation. So if you're unsure, um, is what I'm seeing here uh, related to autism, or should I even have an evaluation done at all, the MCHAT is a really great way for you to uh, make that determination. <clears throat> I wanted to note here that most pediatricians do not do the MCHAT until 24 months. Um, so if you have history with your pediatrician, if you have older children, you know that that is around the time that they will do it, but you can do this earlier yourself. And uh, this QR code takes you there. It's actually to the Autism Speaks uh, website who've, who've made this auto, automated um, that you can click through and get the results right then and there, okay? Okay, so now after you've identified some issues or potential concerns, perhaps you're going to begin the evaluation process, uh, obtain services for your child, or perhaps your child's already in intervention. What are some parent-led interventions that you can do either while you're waiting for services or that you can do to supplement the services that your child is currently receiving? And as I mentioned before, this will be the bulk of our presentation today. <laughs> I'm going to start by talking about tummy time. And this is for if your child is very young. So really up until eight to nine months. Okay, so eight to nine months or younger, they're not yet crawling. This is uh, what you would like to spend a lot of time doing with your baby. You might know of tummy time as an important way to promote physical development. There are various ways to promote tummy time. You can prop your baby up on a pillow. You can place toys in front of them to entice them to lift up their head and their upper body. Um, you know, the common physical pro uh, progression with tummy time is lifting their head, then their neck, then their chest, then propping themselves up on their forearms and then up on their hands. However, what you may not know is that it is also a great way to promote social development. And this is done by placing your baby on your chest. As opposed to on the floor or on a pillow, you can adjust the angle by propping yourself up on a pillow. Um, and that could be done to your baby's needs. So if it's just the beginning, you might want to you know, be propped up a little more. And as they get stronger and, and stronger, um, you can you know, lay more flat. <laughs> when doing this, your baby's face to face with you. So it's an excellent opportunity for social interaction. You can experiment with different facial expressions, sounds, you can talk to your baby, encourage your baby. Um, you can also establish that a social interaction is a reward for them attempting to lift themselves up. One of the most important lessons for your developing child is to learn that interacting with other people is meaningful. And that is because most of learning and most of development occurs within a social context, right? Therefore, it's important that a child shows interest in adults and caregivers by looking at them or orienting towards them, which can be termed social looking. This is different than looking at objects or events in the environment, and those things are also important. 
But specifically, social looking includes making eye contact, sharing attention, or what we call joint attention, social referencing, so looking to parents to see what their facial expressions look like in a situation that might be ambiguous to the baby or, or toddler, or simply just looking at caregivers' faces and orienting towards caregivers. So what can you do to promote social looking? One of the easiest ways to do that is something very familiar to all of us we all know about is playing peekaboo. Uh, this game is about looking for an adult, looking to see where is that adult and when they disappear, are they going to come back? <clears throat> looking for another person. Here in this picture, you actually see a combination of tummy time and peekaboo. <laughs> so you can, you can kill two birds with one stone there. Here's a video of a mom and a baby playing peekaboo. Now notice on the second time during a small pause, a short pause, uh, mommy says, where's mommy? And the baby shows interest by looking in the direction of her mom. Where's mommy? Where's mommy? Oh. <laughs> that was a great example. Um, and you're going to see a lot of that in this uh, presentation today, where small pauses, inserting small, subtle pauses into your interactions uh, provides your baby with an opportunity to engage in a response. And in this situation, it was looking to see where mommy was. Another activity to promote social looking we call looks to resume activities. Um, and you can include visual, you can include auditory or tactile touch components, swinging and singing, tickling and making noises. So you would repeat some kind of activity a few times and pause and see what the baby does. If the baby looks, then you resume the activity. You resume the making noises or the tickling or the throwing up in the air. And you can repeat this a few times so that the baby really gets on a roll with turning and looking to you to get you to resume the activity. And we have a, a nice video of that here. Take a look at um, the, the mom and the baby here. Uh, mommy is rocking the baby and making a noise and she repeats the same thing, okay? And then she pauses and she waits for the baby to look and then she resumes the activity. That's a great example. Feeding is another great time to work on looking. It's the same sequence as we discussed in the last activity, you begin feeding, make sure your baby has had a few, a few spoonfuls of food before you start. You can pair some words or sounds here like yum yum. Then pause the spoon near the baby's face and wait for them to look up at you. Then place the spoon in their mouth. If they don't look, you can swipe the spoon up toward your face so that they track it to your eyes and so they know where to look. Um, and you will see this exact sequence in the next video. Okay. Whoa, isn't that oatmeal good? Yummy. So here the mommy, mommy demonstrated that spoon swipe. And so you know she had given the baby a few spoonfuls right before she did that. You can really have fun with this one, right? You can make all kinds of sounds and motions. Think about the choo-choo train or an airplane. Some prerequisites here for social looking overall is that the baby can orient towards sounds. Um, and so if your baby or your child is having some trouble um, and you may be concerned that maybe they're not hearing something, it's important to have a hearing evaluation. And we'll talk to your pediatrician about that. Another foundational skill is what we call reciprocity or social back and forth. If you think about it, most in social interactions involve turn taking. I do something, you do something, and then I do something again. 
and so on. This reciprocal nature of social interaction is something babies learn very early on in development. And reciprocity, or what we call reciprocity, can be both verbal and nonverbal. So what are some ways that we can promote nonverbal reciprocity? Let's start there. The first activity is handing items back and forth with your baby. So for example, you might shake a maraca, hand, your, hand it to your child to shake, then put your hand out to encourage them giving it back. And if they don't, provide some gentle guidance. And then you shake the maraca, and then you repeat it again back and forth. Turn. Good. Good job. Mommy's turn. Look. Mommy's turn. Thank you. Shake, 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 shake. Anna's turn. Okay, great. Another activity that you can do to promote nonverbal reciprocity is taking turns with completion tasks. So, for example, you might use activities, uh, age appropriate activities, like um, a bucket or a puzzle or a ring stacker or a shape sorter. Um, you place a piece in the bucket or the piece on the ring stacker or a piece in the puzzle, give it to the child. They take a turn and do the same thing. You might have to provide some gentle guidance for that and then encourage your baby to hand it back to you. Again, providing some gentle guidance if needed you taking a turn and putting an item on the ring on the ring stacker or the puzzle piece in the puzzle and handing it back to your baby and so on, right? So we have, we're seeing a lot of um, recurrent themes here, repeating activities, right? Okay, now I'm going to switch and talk about activities to promote verbal reciprocity. So a verbal back and forth. Um, one of the best ways to do this is to imitate your child's vocalizations. So your child might vocalize or babble or make some kind of noise, and then you babble in that same way, right back to your baby or child. And it's important to be face-to-face -face when you're doing this. Then don't forget to pause or wait and give your baby a chance to vocalize again. And then you're going to repeat this. Okay, so what, do you, what happens if your child has limited vocalizations? One important tip that, that can help is that thinking about speaking um, or vocalizing as movements. Um, and so one way that you can encourage speaking or vocalizing is through movement with your baby. So regardless of age, you know, bouncing, lifting up your child, um, you can encourage sounds in that way. Um, and you will see that in, the, in this next video I have. Notice how in this video, the mom pauses and gives the baby a chance to make some sounds back to her and also that she's using movement to promote some sounds from the baby. Okay, another activity that you can do to promote verbal reciprocity is to do fill-ins with songs or books. So sing a familiar song with actions, for example, the Itsy Bitsy Spider or Wheels on the Bus. Sometimes there are books that have those songs in them or books that repeat like Brown Bear, Brown Bear. Um, and then pause and wait and wait for your child to make a sound. They may not say a full word or they may not say a sound that is represented in the book or in the song, but any sound that they make at all. Um, as soon as they make it, then you would resume the song or the book. I would be remiss if I didn't met, mention here the baby shark song. I know that's very popular. <laughs> Okay, so I'm gonna, going to make a shift and move on to another foundational skill. Um, and this is called communication with gestures. Communicating is more than just talking. Um, it occurs non-verbally even before children learn how to talk. A child might point to things in the environment to gain access to it. 
to share interest with you as if they're saying, look at that. I uh, took obtain information as if to ask, what is that? A child might pull or push you towards something to gain access to see something as well or to obtain something. Children show things to others by holding it up for someone else to see. So these are lots of ways that children communicate using gestures. They also might hand something to you um, as a way to ask for help. For example, you know, opening a container for their snack. And that leads us to the first activity where you can promote communication with gestures and that's accessing help. So you kind of have to set this one up and, and think a little bit about it before time, but placing a snack in a container, for example, um, shake the container, make sure it's sealed, um, just so that your baby or child can see uh, what's in it. Um, it's great to have a clear container so they can see it. Um, and then hand it to them and wait, don't help them right away. You also don't want them to get too frustrated. Then gently guide them to hand it to you so that they see that interacting with someone else is meaningful, that it gets them something that, that they want. And then you open it and hand it back to them. And you can praise as well. Um, you can use words like, oh, good job giving that to mommy, or I'm happy to help you, or thank you for handing it to grandma or to daddy. Um, and then you would repeat this, right? You would do this a few times in a row. Here's an example. You'll see in this video, the mother hands her child a container that she knows he can open. And then she waits for the child to hand it to her before she opens it. And like I mentioned before, if your child doesn't hand it to you, you can gently guide them to do that. So in this video, that was something that had been practiced. As you could tell, she waited. She was just about to prompt him to do it. And then he did it on his own, which is nice. That's something that you would see over time after you repeated it um, and had, had lots of practice. Another activity to promote communication with gestures is uh, to promote pointing. So using interesting objects or events to promote pointing. So blow bubbles, activate animated toys, and gently bring your child over to that interesting activity or event and position their finger to point and touch the object. So you can gently just you know, guide their finger to point and touch the object. And then when they do, you can praise and engage socially with your child and the object if it's something that you can engage with. If not, you just want to have a nice social interaction in and around it. So maybe it's something like an airplane flying by. So then you might have a nice interaction in and around it. Oh, look at that airplane. It's so fast. Other ways to promote pointing is to model it yourself. Uh, model pointing. Um, sometimes children will imitate after uh, you do it for them. Another way is to provide a choice of two things that your child uh, might want during mealtime or during playtime or during bath. Um, so hold two things up and ask them which one they want and then gently guide them to point. Maybe as they're reaching towards one, you, you would form, help them form the pointing response. So now we're gonna switch and talk about imitation. I, I referred to it a little bit in the last skill. Imitation is essential for learning just about everything, um, including language, social skills, and how to complete tasks. You can teach your child to imitate your actions with objects. For example, banging a hammer. Um, you can imitate, teach them to imitate your physical movements. For example, clapping your hands or stomping your feet. I'm going to start with how to encourage imitation with objects. So the first thing you'll do is set up two identical objects. Sit face to face or across from each other. You can do this at a table with your child in a high chair or a booster chair might help to keep them in one place so that you can uh, increase attending or ensure attending, or you could do it on the floor during a playtime. 
You'll start by modeling a simple action. For example, placing a stacking cup on another stacking cup, or placing a shape into a bin, or tapping two blocks together. Wait a few seconds, see what your child does. You might want to present the model a few times, so show it a few times in a row. And then gently guide your child to do the same and offer encouragements as you're doing it. Praise and smile your, uh, at your child when they do it, or even if you had to help them. Be sure to vary your responses. Don't let them you know, jump the gun or do the activity before you have the chance to model it. And so here it's important to try to model actions that your child doesn't already know. So you might have to think of some odd things that maybe they haven't done yet with um, their toys. Here's a video example of imitation with objects. Notice here how mom used some gentle guidance to help her child imitate. She also pairs a consistent verbal marker with the action that she's modeling. And so that's something to keep in mind as well. Tap, 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 tap. <laughs> Okay, the same sequence that we just reviewed, now we can think about doing that with actions. So you can sit face to face or stand across from each other. Um, again, you can do this at a table or high chair, booster chair, or on the floor, outside, inside. I'll start by modeling a simple action, for example, clapping hands or touching your toes or marching or touching your head. Wait a few seconds and see what your child does. Uh, you might want to present the model a few times. Again, the same sequence as imitation with objects. Gently guide your child and offer some encouragement. And when they either make an attempt or do it on their own, be sure to praise and smile. And same thing as with the actions, vary those responses. Try to think of things that maybe the child doesn't already know how to do. I'm going to move on and talk about our next skill set. We're going to talk about understanding language, something that we also refer to as receptive language. Children understand or respond to language well before they can speak. Understanding language is not passive. It's fairly active in that the child has to attend to others and attend to what's happening in their environment and respond to what they are saying accordingly. Examples include finding or selecting items in response to a speaker. So get your shoes or where's your belly. All of that is about understanding language or receptive language. Following instructions like come here or sit down. Skills such as matching and sorting. So putting all the red toy foods together and the green toy foods together or all the blue trains together and all the red trains together. That's also a sign of understanding language. So if you see your child doing some kind of sorting and grouping of items, that's a sign that they're understanding language. Okay, here's a mom. She's working to teach her child to respond to her instructions, which is pointing to body parts. You will see the first um, that she shows him as she's giving the direction. So she's saying the direction and gently guiding him at the same time. Um, and then she gives him a chance to do it on his own. Carson, point to your elbow. Point to your elbow, good job! Carson, point to your belly. Point to your belly, good job! Okay, here's some additional ways to promote the understanding of language. Label what you and your child are doing and do this often. Label things around you, so within daily activities. Read to your child as much as possible. Label something, wait a few seconds, give your child a chance to respond and see if they can go get it or pick it up or hand it to you. And if not, you can, again, use some of those strategies we talked about, some gentle guidance and using some praise. All right, so the final area that we will discuss today is talking. Um, oh, I see that my slides did not switch. Just give me one second. A little bit of a technical issue here. 
My PowerPoint is not responding. Here we go. Can you see the next slide? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, so the final area we'll, we'll discuss today is talking. Talking starts really early in development as well. Um, before they're actually, babies are actually using words, um, we refer to this as expressive language. It can also include sign language. Um, today I'm going to focus on uh, vocal output as expressive language. It starts when your child first makes sounds, they engage in cooing, then sounds of pleasure, sounds of distress. These sounds vary so that caregivers can learn to respond to them accordingly. So for example, when the baby's hungry, that sound sounds a little different than when the baby needs to be changed. Um, then babbling occurs, then single use of words or use of single words, and then putting those words into phrases or short meaningful sentences around the age of two, we call that telegraphic speech. Those are two word sentences. And if you have a child around this age, or if you recall from your other children, things like puppy jump or me up or mommy eats. So that's what you see emerging around the age of two. So how do we encourage talking? The first way is to talk to your child often. Sit face to face across from each other, label what they're doing, label what you're doing, label things around you in your daily activities. Notice some of these are the same as promoting understanding of language. Read to your child, read often. Imitate your child's sounds. That's something we talked about earlier in terms of that you know, reciprocity, right? Expand on their words. So if your child says something, um, so maybe they say puppy jump, you might expand on that and say, yes, look at that cute little puppy. He jumped. Um, wait a few seconds and give your child a chance to respond. So there's a lot to say for waiting and pausing here and giving your child an opportunity to engage in a response. And then of course, using praise and encouragement um, and smiling and showing in your facial expressions that um, you approve of what they're doing and saying and encouraging them. Okay, and here's our final video of mom and baby sitting on the floor with some toys. And here mom's just simply labeling what the baby's doing. You wanna play with your fish bowl? Oh, you took out a bullfish! Wow! So cool! Look, Anna! A orange fish! Got you! You like that? There's the orange fish! Okay, so some final tips that I wanted to highlight. You can do these activities during your daily, everyday routines. Playing, eating, bathing, getting dressed, grocery shopping, whatever it is, getting in and out of the car. Um, think about it as meaningful moments versus, you know, oh, I have to sit and do a long session. So make it part of your everyday routines um, and have fun with it and be silly. Um, if you're feeling stressed out about it, then it's likely that, you know, your baby or your child might sense that. Okay, have a good time with it. And, you know, um, don't worry about making a mistake or doing something wrong. Just the more that, you know, um, that you attempt to do these things and that you work these things into your daily routines, the better. I wanted to close out with um, just a little more information and resources for parents. So if you are concerned about your child's de development, please don't hesitate to schedule a formal evaluation. We know that uh, early intervention uh, produces the best long-term outcomes. So who can you schedule an evaluation with? A pediatric neurologist, a licensed psychologist, a developmental pediatrician, speech and language pathologist. If your child is under the age of three, there are free services available to you through the state early intervention system. Also, it's helpful to just, as a side note, be informed about your own insurance, whether you're in a government program or a private insurance. Just know what is required and know what um, your insurance provides. In terms of accessing service as a, services, as I mentioned, there's early intervention, 
Um, if you're going through your own insurance, that does require a prescription from a medical doctor and it requires a diagnosis. If your child is older than the age of three and um, you are interacting with, you're likely interacting with their school district, um, that requires a medical diagnosis. Of course, the school district also does their own evaluations as well. Some additional resources here. Autism New Jersey is an excellent resource for parents. Autism Speaks. The CDC Developmental Milestones I mentioned before. This book here, the Activity Kit for Babies and Toddlers at Risk. That's the book on the right. That has some excellent activities that you can do in your daily routines with your babies and toddlers. The Carolina Curriculum for Infants and Toddlers with Special Needs. Um, the Pathways.org website has lots of videos you know, uh, showing some activities, those are really helpful. I wanted to mention Dr. Kate Fisk at Rutgers University um, has some wonderful resources for parents and families who are coping with autism. So if you, you just do a quick Google search for her, you'll find some wonderful supportive information there. And of course, here at Alpine Learning Group, um, our, here's our website. And at the end, after we take some questions, I will put up another slide uh, that shows our available uh, services. So at this point, I think we're ready, Bridget, for questions. Thank you, Jamie. That was a wonderful talk. Um, sorry, everybody, if we've had some audiovisual issues, we will um, be correcting the sound on the videos when we do the, uh, when we post the video. So if you missed any of the content because of audio uh, problems, come back and look at the recordings and you'll we'll get a, a, a much better sense of the, the sound on the videos. So um, does anybody have any questions? Uh, there is one question in the chat that says, how can you attempt to engage a learner with high stereotypy such as spinning and mouthing items? So I didn't know, uh, Jamie, if you had any tips for how do you prompt behavior when you have uh, some repetitive behavior as well? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I think sometimes that could be um, off-putting that a parent might pause or be unsure of what to do. But really, I just encourage you to do the activities that, you know, I listed here today that you can use that gentle guidance to try to direct them to engage in the appropriate behavior that you want them to engage in. So for example, if you were trying to do a turn-taking, right, or an imitation, um, that you would use that manual guidance, that gentle guidance to get them to um, engage in the response that you want them to engage in and, you know, offer that encouragement and that praise. Um, and you might have to work in, you know, some additional rewards too, right? Um, so if your child, um, you know, has a special snack or a special toy that they really like, in addition to your praise and encouragement, you might have to provide that as well when they engage in the response that you're going for. Okay, well, thank you all for being here. Um, as a reminder, Alpine has a full range of educational and clinical services for individuals of all ages. If you're interested in our services, you can feel free to call the number here on the slide or go to our website at alpinelearninggroup.org. And as a reminder, this webinar is a final in a series of free webinars that we've conducted over the course of the last month. Um, and this is the QR code. Feel free to use your phone to scan that QR code through your, I think it's your photo app that takes you to the link for the other recordings. And this one will, will be up um, within the next week. So thank you all for participating. And this closes our presentation. Thank you, Dr. DeQuinzio. Thank you.